God's peace and his mercy surround you, his love enfold you, and his power lift you up today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been doing this sermon series during this time of Epiphany, time following Christmas, and this is the third week of this that we've been talking about, how to change the world. And if you were here several weeks ago, you probably heard me say that I really do not generally like sermon series that try and tell you what to do and and how to do something, because so often it just boils down to a, a checklist, you know, and then people feel like, well, all I have to do is check this box, check this box, check this box, and we're all set. But I think it's important, too, for us to think in terms of how do we live out our lives as God's people? And if Jesus came to change the world, and he did that certainly through his power as he in, interacted with people, he was the authentic representation of God and God's love, and his love changed people's lives. And if Jesus, by his death on the cross and his resurrection, changed the world, God desires to still work in your life and mine to change us, and he desires to change the world, how's he going to do? He chooses to use us as his instruments. So a couple weeks ago, what did we talk about? How to change the world? Well, ask for directions, talking about the wise men, looking for Jesus, looking to his words so that we gain direction, and then following. Last week, we talked about how to change the world. Well, behold and invite. And how, as John the Baptist pointed to Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, people's lives were changed. And how some of those who found Jesus, or really had been invited by Jesus into a relationship with him, they then went and told other people, you have got to come and see to get to know this one who is the Savior of the world, the God who has come to save us. This week, how to save the world, how to change the world, go fishing. And we get to see Jesus calling some of the first disciples. Maybe this story is familiar to you. Maybe it's not, but my prayer is that this will open up some new ways, first of all, of thinking about how to communicate who Jesus is and what he's done. But also for us to recognize that probably we all need more equipping in order to carry out what Jesus calls us to do if we are to be fishers of men. And so I invite you, if you've got a Bible with you, I invite you to open that up, or if you generally like to look at your smartphone or your your tablet, we invite you to use that. Go to BibleGateway.com or Bible.com and follow along. Or if uh, you need something handy, this little insert in your worship folder has a scripture we're going to be looking at, Matthew chapter 4. And a little bit of context here as we think about this. Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist. The Spirit came down as a dove and rested on him. The Father gives his words, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then after that, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days where he's tempted by Satan. That brings us up to, in, John, in Matthew's Gospel, where we are today. And as Jesus is hearing about John the Baptist now being taken and arrested, he knows that this is the time that God appointed for me to begin my ministry. I'm going to go out and do that. And Matthew chapter 4 begins by introducing this and really framing Jesus' ministry or interpreting, translating who Jesus is by looking back to the Old Testament, a prophecy that's fulfilled Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Here it is. The people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. 
Now think about this. So often I think when someone says, well, maybe we should be talking to people and inviting them to church or telling them about God or telling them about Jesus, we really many times jump to this little phrase that is our, our shorthand. And if someone were to ask you, well, what do you believe about Jesus? Probably most of us would answer the question if we've been going to church for a while or if we've got some background. We'd probably say something like, well, I believe that Jesus was sent by God. He overcame sin. He died on the cross to take away my sin, and he rose again. How many of you would probably say something like that? Nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, that is, that is just bedrock. But how to translate this Jesus to people today. That may not be the first thing that translates to people when we want to share about who Jesus is. But, you know, I think everyone in this world, all you have to do is look at the news or just go through life. Everyone knows that this world is filled with darkness. And so to be able to say, if someone were to say, who's, this, who's Jesus? What's he all about? He's the one who brings the light into the darkness. That might translate. Because all of us have had those times where we've been in a dark place. And we need some light. We need the light that only Jesus can bring. And he is the light that the darkness absolutely cannot overcome. He's the light that scatters the darkness. So maybe put that in your toolbox just a little bit. And then Jesus, after Matthew frames out who Jesus is and tells us, maybe gives us this as a shorthand to be able to share Jesus or explain Jesus to people. Then verse 17, From that time, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, that's a pretty succinct, very packed sermon. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Could you imagine if the preacher came in on a day like today and said, I've got my message for you. Repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Let's sing a song, amen. We'll have a prayer, goodbye. You know, some of you would be thinking, I am going to get to watch that football game today, right? <laughs> Is there a football game on today? Maybe a couple of them. They, they might be kind of important games if you're into football. I, I don't know. Just saying. Who are you pulling for? Uh, I heard Packers over here. Yeah, I know there's some Packers fans here. Yeah, I'm pulling for the Bears. I think they're... <laughs> the Bears. No, back to this sermon. This sermon of Jesus. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. Let's unpack that just a little bit. So Matthew has already told us Jesus is the one who brings the light. Jesus here in his message is saying something's changed in this world. I am the one who brings the kingdom. And you know, there's something powerful when you think about Jesus' message like that. I'm the one, he says, who brings the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is drawn near, and it's as if Jesus is standing there. You're looking at the one who brings it. Now, why do I want to highlight that for us? Maybe that gives us another hook to talking about who Jesus is in this world. Think about our past week. What did we see this past week in our nation? We saw a peaceful transfer of power, and we saw a lot of protests right? Kind of reminds me of eight years ago, what we saw, a peaceful transfer of power and protests. In fact, as I think about it, it reminds me of 16 years ago, where we saw a peaceful transfer of power and protests. And even 24 years ago, we kind of got a pattern going here, don't we? There's something that we get on some level, though, in our society, in our world. It's who's at the table, or who's running the table? Who's got the seat of power? We kind of get that. Then why wouldn't we want to talk with people about Jesus and say, you know what, I believe that he's got all the power. Because he said something about the kingdom. God's kingdom. And he's the one who brings that kingdom near. 
that might help somebody to think when they're feeling powerless or where they're feeling like there's all these things going on that are outside of their control, either in their own life or in our world, to know that there's one that they can count on who has the power and who executes that power in showing his love and his forgiveness. Well, after Jesus begins his preaching ministry, what's he going to do? He's going to get him some disciples. Verse 18, Matthew chapter 4. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. Jesus is coming to shine the light on these two guys. We met them last week in John's Gospel. We got the picture of how they interacted with Jesus before this. But Jesus sees them. They're casting their nets into the lake for their fishermen. And he says, come, follow me. And I will send you out to fish for people. Come. This is what I'm going to do. This is what you're going to be doing. I'll have you fishing for people in no time. And what do we see that happens with Peter and his brother Andrew? At once, they drop their nets and they follow him. They leave behind their livelihood. They leave behind something of value to them, those nets. And they follow Jesus. And then Jesus goes a little further. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. And Jesus, he's got some sort of power. Not, not, not uh, for those of you who are Star Wars fans, it's, it's not a Jedi mind trick. But his call has power to change lives. And so Peter and Andrew, they leave behind everything to follow Jesus. James and John, they're with their dad. It's family business. How that must have been for them to say, Dad, we got to go. They leave the boat behind. They leave their dad behind. They're going to follow Jesus. They've gotten the call from the one who has come to bring the kingdom. And the light that Jesus brings has now shone on these disciples. And that really brings me to the main topic for today. You know, remember how to change the world? Go fishing. And I thought to myself, you know, this isn't really a great topic for me to be preaching on because I'm not really a good fisherman. So if we're going to draw some parallels from real-world fishing to what Jesus is talking about here, I'm not that guy. In fact, have you, any of you ever gone on a charter boat? I have a couple of times. You know, people like to invite me to go out on charter boats to go fishing. You know why? There's this thing, at least they tell me this every time I go, that you put some money in the pot, right? And then whoever's got the most fish, they kind of split that. At least that's how they explain it to me. It seems I get skunked every single time. And that means I get no fish. That, I mean, I've been out there. I'm seeing the dolphin in the water. You know, they're changing colors left and right. As they're just getting pulled out. And I'm like, nothing on my line. So how can I be talking about going fishing? So I did some research. That's what you do when you don't know what you're talking about, right? So where did I go? I went to the internet. They can't put anything on the internet unless it's true. <laughs> and I typed in there, how to go fishing. Did a Google search, came right up. This WikiHow pages. And it gave some information about how to go fishing. And I thought, you know, I, I'm going to use this stuff in my sermon. This is really practical. The first thing I noticed, there was all this information about preparing. And I thought, isn't that interesting? It's not like you just pick up and go. Now, maybe if you're a seasoned fisherman, you've already got some of these things in mind. But some of the things that they had in there, very practical. 
you want to figure out where you're going to go to go fishing, hey, there's going to be a little bit of different type of fishing in Lake Conway from out in the ocean, right? You want to figure out what type of fish you're going to be trying to catch. And that's going to determine what type of equipment you're going to be using. I thought, very practical advice. I don't know if I'll ever get to use it, but practical. And I thought to myself, you know, how does this relate to going fishing if Jesus is the one who calls us to follow him and to be fishers of men, to cast the net of God's love and draw people in? I thought to myself, how often do we tell people, you got to be sharing Jesus with somebody. you got to be inviting someone to church. You're not, you need to be witnessing. How many times have you ever heard a pastor say that? And I am probably, I might be the worst. Hear the pastor say that without ever equipping you to do so. We need the proper equipment, don't we? We need to be equipped. We find this with parents, too. We tell them, you know, you need to be the primary teacher of the faith to your child. That's how they're going to get it. We tell them that, and then we never tell them how to. We never teach them or equip them to pass the faith along in their family. Well, let me tell you, if we're going to follow Jesus and do what he's calling us to do, we're going to need some equipping. There's some equipment that we need. And Jesus does just that with, with these disciples, with Peter and Andrew and James and John. Look at what happens next. Go back to the scripture here. Matthew chapter 4. He says, you know what? The first thing you're going to do, you're going to get equipped as you ride along with me. You're going to come. Watch. I want you to watch what I do. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee and the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. So what's the first thing that Jesus does to equip the disciples? He has them watch him. If you want to be equipped, as you follow Jesus, and as Jesus calls us to be fishers of men, if you want to be equipped, keep your eyes on Jesus. And maybe do this. You know, we were talking about the new Bible studies or the Bible study. Join one of the Bible studies on Sunday, 9.45 in the morning, Sunday mornings. Or there's a Bible class on, on Wednesday that Pastor Grandpa teaches over in the boardroom in the administration building, 9.30 every Wednesday, 9.30, Pastor Grandpa's study. Or maybe, here's a radical idea. Make some time to get to know Jesus through your own study of the Scripture. Read. Get to know Him. Look at the Gospels. Those are the four biographies of Jesus that God authorized. And in there, you can see the things that Jesus does. You can listen to the words that Jesus taught. And in following Jesus and in, in investigating that, you know, sometimes I think, too, uh, we're not always good readers, right? So if you don't like to sit and read, listen to this. In our day and age with technology, you can go to BibleGateway.com or Bible.com. You can just click on something and have the Bible read in there. And that's one way that God will equip you and me to know who Jesus is, to be closer to him, and then to share about him. There's other ways, too. You know, if, if part of that preparation for going fishing, according to that website, is that you got to know what type of fish you're fishing for and where you want to fish, maybe a part of the preparation is prayer. You know, God, help me to see the person 
that needs your love. Praying that God would open your eyes so that he would reveal to you who it is that he would like to catch in his net of love. And praying then for that person specifically that God would open their hearts and then just sitting back and saying, you know, I just want to pray, God, that whenever you want to use me, I'm available. And I'll just wait. Oh, one other thing about being equipped. We have an equipping event coming up here. Did you know this? I don't know if you knew this, but because it's new and I'm announcing it today. February 18th, Saturday. There's this thing called I Neighborhood that somebody's come up with. And it helps to give a framework for God's people to think about how it is that you can connect with somebody and maybe have the opportunity to share the gospel. Very simple framework. It's not rocket science. But the intentionality and knowing the framework helps a lot going to be right here at Prince of Peace, Saturday morning, the 18th of February. And it's called I Neighborhood. And the simple framework is this. You know, thinking about the relationships that you have in your workplace, your home, wherever you might be, how do you bless them? How do you bond with them? How do you listen to them? How do you engage them? B-L-E-S. How do you serve them? And then, what would you do if God gave you an opportunity to share with them? I want to hope that kind of gets your attention, because we want to equip you. Now, the next thing I saw on that wiki page was that when you cast your line, you got to wait. And this is the part that I'm never really good with, because I guess that's why it's called fishing and not catching, right? You get that? It's called fishing, not catching. And unless you're at a stocked pond, which I got to do once with my family up in Colorado. It was a stocked pond. All you had to do was drop the line in the water, and you're pulling out fish. And then you had to pay them if you were going to leave them there. <laughs> Anyhow, don't go to that stocked pond. Wait. I'm not really good at waiting. You know, maybe the sermon moved you, and you're like, I'm going to get in gear. I'm going to share. Well, you know, wait. That maybe reminds us not only to spend time praying, but also to understand that this isn't about you and me going out there and being super witness in God's name. It's really about us simply being available to God and letting him do his work in us as we grow closer to Jesus and through us as he reaches out to people through us, using us as his instrument or his conduit. You have to sometimes spend some time intentionally fishing and let God do the catching and let God do the cleaning. I'm going to leave you today. Next week, we're going to be talking not about fishing, but we're going to talk about You know, how to change the world? Be weak. Think about that. Be weak. But I want you to think, as we go away today, or as you pray, as we take communion together, if Jesus came so that he could change the world, if Jesus is the one who brings the light, if Jesus is the one who brings the kingdom, how might Jesus want to use you and me to shine that light and to extend his kingdom into this world all by his power all by his work and all to his glory in Jesus name Amen I invite you to stand we're going to say a prayer of confession asking God to cleanse us of our sins acknowledging our need for him our need for his